So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this seventh science salon uh, arranged by Science Stories. It is um, four salons every semester, and this semester the, the underlying theme is water. And it happens actually to be that water is the strangest substance in the universe. And to me, that was quite a surprise. And if you want to know more about that, you can at sciencestories.dk, you can find a radio program on why water is the strangest substance. Who decided it's the strangest? Yeah, that you'll have to hear, listen to the radio no, program I want to, to know find now. out. <laughs> but tonight, yeah. because I don't know. Change the subject. Yes, okay. exactly. But tonight, we will have a broader perspective on water. But I promise you, we will come across quite some strange things. Right? Okay. I yeah. will hold you to that promise. Yeah, but you are the one who have to sort of present the You will the hold me things. to that promise. Then. Yes, okay. I will. Um, my name is Line Fries Frelixen. I'm a science journalist. And I have the honor to interview, or maybe you'll interview me. I don't know how it'll end out. Okay. But to interview our guest. And I've really been looking forward because it's a really special guest we have tonight. Comes all the way, way from the States. And um, it is Mark Abrahams who is a man of many, many abilities. So many that I have to you know, look into my papers. <laughs> um, you studied math. You program computer systems mm -hmm. for various things. You have written books. You have written columns for The Guardian for more than 10 years. You have founded the journal Annals of Improbable Research. And then, not the least, you have founded the Ig Nobel Prizes. And you founded that in 1991. That's right. And you are also the master of the ceremony every year. And the Ig Nobel Prize is, um, is such a big thing that is, it is actually held at Harvard University every year. And it is crowded. And every year, you have several former Nobel Prize winners on stage participating in the ceremony mm -hmm. because they really like what you are doing. And I also have to add that he also writes some operas for each ceremony. So, as I said, a man of many abilities, and I haven't even mentioned all here. Um, and the, the only criteria to win an Ig Nobel Prize is that it, the research has to make us first laugh and then think. And I just would like to mention a few of the prizes that has been given during the years. Before you do, yeah? that's an unusual criterion. Almost every other prize in the world claims to be for the very best mm -hmm. things. Or a few prizes are for the very worst. But you know, Olympic medals are for the best athletic performance. Nobel prizes are for the best science or the best literature. Uh, the worst dressed prize is for the worst dressed. But our prize, the Ig Nobel Prize, we don't care. It is not relevant whether something is good or bad. It does not matter to us, for these purposes, whether something is important or completely worthless. What does matter is that it makes anybody, anywhere in the world, it makes them laugh immediately, and then it sticks in their head, so that a week later, they're still thinking about it, and they want to talk to their friends about it. That's the quality that we look for. That looks great. And you know, that was a question I wanted to ask in two minutes, but you just came ahead of me, and that's so cool. <laughs> um, so now I'll list a few of the prizes, and maybe with the things you just said, that is, um, it's easier for you to understand, because at one point the anatomy prize was giving, given to two researchers that were measuring scrotal temperature, asymmetry in naked and closed postmen in France. There's also been a prize... We should add, we that should may add be that. confusing for people. Is there anyone here who needs an explanation of any of those <laughs> words? Or maybe, should you just give, even though it's not water, I'm not going to demonstrate. You... Okay, sure. good, because then you would have to use the and audience. I'm not going to ask anyone in the audience to okay. demonstrate either. Could you, could you then add a few no, words? No, no, it's, I don't think we have to. Okay. But then there was but also... I, I was trying to be polite. <laughs> then there was also a neuroscience prize given to a group that was demonstrating that brain researchers, by using complicated instruments and simple statistics, can see meaningful brain activity anywhere even in a dead salmon. Yes. And I'm thinking, so when they see meaningful brain activity in human brains, we don't really know what it is since they can see it in a you dead salmon. You just got to salmon. the heart of it. 
That was done by some scientists who take those beautiful fMRI images. Everybody's seen those beautiful brain image pictures. And they were trying to get their fellow scientists to realize what they're doing is very complicated and it has to be done very, very carefully because if, if it is not done carefully, it's easy to make mistakes. It's easy to think you found something wonderful when in fact you found nothing. So what they were pointing out was these machines, if you're not careful, will give you all kinds of information that seems to be saying this and that and all kinds of insight about the brain. But in fact, it's saying nothing. It's just random. Because and to prove that, they went, and they went to the supermarket. They got a, a dead fish, a dead salmon. They put it in the machine. They, they measured it the same way they measure people without being careful. And that's the way a lot of scientists up until that point did it. And what they discovered is that apparently this dead salmon had all kinds of interesting thoughts going on. <laughs> and that got so much attention in the science world, in that branch of the science world, that from what I hear, a lot of people around the world, a lot of scientists began to be much more careful about doing that particular kind of test. I actually remember it. Yeah. yeah. And also, some of those scientists got really angry because here you had other scientists pointing out that we weren't very careful. We, oh. we could have been more careful in the past. Oh. Great. Then there was a chemistry prize given to a Japanese group that was determining the ideal density of airborne wasabi, I mean wasabi from sushi, to awaken sleeping people in case of a fire or other emergency and for applying this knowledge to invent the wasabi alarm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that what it sounds like? That's exactly what it was. <laughs> they had a reason for wanting to do this. The reason was that deaf people, people who have lost their hearing or, or cannot hear for whatever reason, um, they cannot hear fire alarms. So this was an attempt to come up with some way to alert them if there's a fire. You know, shouting is not going to work. But if you've eaten any kind of Japanese food that has that wasabi, you know the feeling up your nose. And they went through some careful tests. They had to find a way to put this smell in the air strongly enough that they knew it would awaken people but not so strongly that it would kill them. <laughs> <laughs> Point taken well. And then there has been given a linguistics prize to a group that showed that rats sometimes cannot tell the difference between a person speaking Japanese backwards and a person speaking Dutch backwards. And sometimes they can. And sometimes they can. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, why is that? Interesting. Oh, we don't, why is it interesting? Yes. <laughs> How is that not interesting? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I'm just... I can know, think thinking. of many other questions beginning with the word why that you could have asked there. <laughs> but you think it's interesting to know whether rats can distinguish between Japanese spoken backwards and Dutch spoken yeah. backwards, yeah? yeah? And, and, and if you're about to ask about Danish and other languages, <laughs> I do not know the answer. You do not know the answer. Yeah, I think that work is still to be done. Cool. Um, and actually, now, because I thought I would just mention these, but it's much nicer when you interact, because now is the point where I wanted to say that you do not only want us to laugh, you really also want us to think. And from the conversation we had on Skype, I could tell that you were really yeah. engaged in society and all these things. Um, and I wanted to quote you because you once said that you went to college at Harvard and majored in applied math. Bill Gates was in the class a year ahead of you yeah. and you majored in the same subject. But he, like me, eventually started a software company, but I, unlike him, made the mistake of graduating from college. Yeah. So, you know, I'm quite happy that you didn't go the same way as Bill Gates because then probably we wouldn't have you here tonight and we are most happy to have you. And now then I wanted people to give you a hand because... It's, uh, I suppose it's a delight to have strangers applaud you for being a failure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But it depends how Thank you look, how you look. Maybe, I don't know if you should wear your hat of... Ceremony I'll, now I'll, and tell okay. us. 
in the ceremony, and we, I guess we're going to talk more about the ceremony, the ceremony is very elaborate. It uh, happens at Harvard in the biggest theater. It's a beautiful old theater, not, not as old as this, but it's a beautiful old place. It's also the biggest classroom, fits 1,100 people. And it's always completely filled on Ig Nobel night. And I always wear a hat, and it's this kind of hat. It's a, it's a nice French name for this kind of pop-up thing called a chapeau claque. And the one I had been wearing for years fell apart, so I ordered a new one, a new old one. And I brought it with me. I'm wearing it for the first time. And I discovered that it's too small. <laughs> but I saw the old one. That was held together by gaffer tape, so I think yeah, it, it is Yeah, that was getting pretty mm. old, and even that mm. fell apart. Mm. Okay, you're, you're welcome to Do you think it'll fit me? I don't know if I feel comfortable. Well, does it fit? Does it fit? It fits, yeah. I think it is. So my brain is smaller than okay. yours, maybe, yeah. Um, <laughs> But I actually, I wanted you to wear it because now we'll just to give you well, an idea. Give me my hat back. <laughs> just to give the audience an idea yeah. of what kind of research, besides the one I mentioned, yeah. and you would come up with um, for your prize ceremonies. We have an old video showing one of the early prizes. And maybe you should just add a few words. Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about as, let's, uh, what you're going to see. This is about a minute or so of video. It's from a documentary film made by the Canadian government about a, a Canadian citizen who won an Ig Nobel Prize. All you need to know is what he was trying to do. He spent many years trying to build and personally test a suit of armor that would protect him from grizzly bears. Grizzly bears are really almost unbelievably big and powerful. So you're going to see many of the tests that he had to, uh, he hoped, save his life in the future. And he won a prize in 98, right? He won a prize in 1998. Yes. Yeah, and now Shall we should we? have the curtain. Yeah. Curtains, please. Curtains, please, yes. And then it yeah. works on its I, own. I, I hope you all agree that uh, that deserves some kind of prize. <laughs> <laughs> One, one other fact about that, uh, there are so many facts about that. One I want to mention, I learned this only recently. Remember the truck at the end that crashed into him and he said they did that 18 times, I think? The person driving that truck was his father. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you could, you would say that this of course makes you laugh, but was it, what do you think was sort of the, the science behind it? To make you I'm think not maybe. going to guess at what was in his mind exactly, and mm. the way he told the story changed from time to time. Mm. There's one thing, though, that I think people really should, should give him credit for. You might question his judgment. I imagine you do. But consider this. He did this for many years, and it did not kill him. How many people have you met in your whole life? How many people have you ever even heard of who are that careful for that long a period of time? I think he deserves some respect for that. For being very careful yeah. for a very long time. Yes. Well, that is really great, but now our underlying theme is water today. And there has been given quite a few Ig Nobel Prizes also for research oh, yes. going into water or at least yeah. liquids. Um, and I would like to, to go into this one um, and elaborate a little bit about that, yeah. because you have been given a fluid dynamics prize. I guess you can invent all the kind of prize categories you feel like. Yeah, we, uh, we give 10 prizes a year, and uh, the categories change. We, we do not have slots to fill, you know, physics prize, a biology prize. We choose the prizes first, and then we try to figure out what category does this fit in. Occasionally, that's difficult. When you think back to Troy Herdebees with the suit of armor, if I asked you, what category does that fit in? It's, it's not clear. It took us months of arguing <laughs> before we finally came up with a category. And we gave that, we did come up with a category. We gave that the prize in uh, safety engineering. Safety engineering. Yeah. I think the Nobel Prize ceremonies, the real Nobel Prize ceremonies, would be funnier with that. Oh, we're not even the fake Nobel. We have no connection to the <laughs> we, you know, we, we just try to remain respectful and never cause problems for them. That's good. That's yeah. good. But 
you have been giving this fluid dynamics prize to a group of researchers who's been studying the dynamic of li liquid slushing, or slushing means skulbe, liquid uh, slushing, to learn what happens when a person walks while carrying a cup of coffee. Yes. Yes. This was some, uh, some physicists in California, and they started to wonder if you hold a full cup of coffee, so it should be full, it could be any other liquid too, but call it coffee. You hold a full cup of coffee, as far out as you can, and you stand up and you walk in a normal way. You just walk. What happens? It's going to spill almost always. Now, is that because you're a very clumsy person? Or is there something else going on? They looked at the physics of it. They did a lot of um, equations, which an equation is just a description of what's happening, and some experiments. And what they discovered was, really, it's almost not your fault. The physics of this forces that to happen. If you walk in a normal way, what's going on is you get into a rhythm. And every time you walk, you know, back and forth, back and forth, you're, this rhythm is going to pump it higher and higher. And so it doesn't take long before the liquid is sloshing, or what's the Danish word? Back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to spill. And that's, that's the physics of it. Now, that was about 10 or 12 years ago. That was not the end of the story. Because a high school student in South Korea read about this. The Ig Nobel Prizes get a lot of attention around the world. He read about this, and he, he thought this was really interesting. So he got the physics paper, and he read all the details. There's a lot of detail. And he started to wonder, um, what would happen if you hold a cup of coffee as far as you can, extending your arm, and walk backwards? Is it the same physics, or is there something else that happens? And so he modeled the equations for that and did some experiments. And he discovered it's a completely different story. When we walk forwards, this is assuming that you're in good health and your body parts are working pretty well, uh, you get into a rhythm. It's hard when you walk. It just automatically happens. But most of us, when we walk backwards, that doesn't happen. It's difficult. If you're an extremely well-trained dancer, maybe you could do it, but almost nobody else. Because of that, you're not going to spill that cup of coffee nearly as often. So for, walking from one place reason. to another, you should actually walk backwards. Yes. Now, of course, if you crash into something or trip, <laughs> that's a problem. So that is quite So we gave, we gave yeah. this high school kid uh, a set, an Ig Nobel Prize of his own about 10 years after the mm. first one. So that was the thing. First laugh, and then think, yeah. oh, is it the same physics? Yeah. And yeah. then you actually this one is nice because you can do it yourself. And once you tell people, everybody says, ah, it's not true. But you can demonstrate, you can get your friend to demonstrate this for you. In, you, know, you think we minute. have wine in the break? Do you think that will work? If you're willing to clean up the floor afterwards, sure. OK, cool. I'll clean up the floor. Well, um, then there was um, also a water prize uh, giving, given to a group that was from the University of Bern in Switzerland for determining by experiment whether it is better to be smashed over the head with a full bottle of beer or with an empty bottle of beer. Yes. Why did they do that study? This was for legal reasons. <laughs> there were some court cases where the severity of the charge, you know, is it attempted murder or something less than that, um, was going to be determined partly by how dangerous this was. And so the question came up, is it more dangerous if somebody hits you over the head with an empty bottle or with a bottle that's full? I think mostly they could not resist the, 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 the excuse to go and test this in the laboratory. And so they did, and they found out that one way, it, well, both ways are dangerous. <laughs> but, um, they, they always say they in no way recommend that you um, hit anyone over the head or allow somebody to hit you over the head with a bottle of beer. But one way, it will, it will, uh, it's more dangerous than the other. Do you know which way that is? 
Yeah, I would like to say, you it's know, with, with, with water in, or with beer inside, it's heavier, but I don't know if, if the, you know, the broken glass it's is smash, It turns out it's, it's, it's not obvious to anybody. No. It's not obvious to them. That's why oh. they went through all this trouble. It turns out it smashes more easily, more quickly, if it's full of liquid. And is that good or bad, that it smashes more Depends quickly? Depends on your situation. <laughs> But, but, did, but did they actually test how badly people were injured? And well, they didn't go as far as getting volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so they... There's so a lot more involved in a particular case, yeah. in a, uh, the question of how bad an injury there will mm. be. Hmm. But again, an interesting study. And then there was this one, which was really... Oh, by the way, when, yeah. when one, of the, uh, one of the team came over to the ceremony at Harvard, he was dressed in a nice suit, and he gave his acceptance speech. And, uh, and then he, he went and he stood at the middle of the stage, he stood up and he reached inside his suit jacket and he pulled out a bottle of beer, which he then smashed over his own head. It was a special theatrical bottle of beer. So he was all right? He was all right, but everybody was shocked. <laughs> um, you have then once given a chemistry prize for a re research study that was creating diamonds from liquid specifically from tequila. Yes, this was a team of scientists in Mexico. <laughs> they, um, they I was going to say discovery, but they, other people had discovered almost anything that has a lot of carbon in it, it is possible to make diamonds. Diamonds are just another form of carbon. Of course, that takes a little doing, but uh, to demonstrate that uh, the new method that they had come up with to do this w was um, interesting they wanted to get attention. And so they thought, well, we're Mexican, we'll do it with tequila. And they made a point of getting the cheapest possible tequila they could buy to do it. But, and they managed. Oh, they managed, yes. Mm. But I guess it's, it's more expensive than digging them out of the ground since... These are very, very tiny diamonds. Very, very tiny diamonds. You could use diamonds. them to coat tools or things, but they're not the size diamonds that you would wear on your finger. OK, that could be fun. Unless though. you have a really, really tiny finger, maybe. <laughs> Well, now I think we would like to show a video again mm -hmm. with a person that is trying to do something with this water. Do you think? Prize. Yeah. Do yeah. you think? Do you want to tell something? Yeah. I'll, this one I'll yeah. describe ahead of time. This was a team of scientists uh, from several countries, but mostly Italian. They're based in Milan, Italy. They. Um, you know that on the moon, the moon ha being smaller than the Earth, um, the force of gravity on the surface there is much less than the gravity, the force that pulls us down here. And they were wondering if you, you know, a normal person, were standing on the surface of the moon, and if somehow there was a lake, a pond full of water, and that you could breathe somehow you know, easily, um, if you were standing on the surface of the moon, would it be possible for you to run across the surface of the moon? You know, is the gravity uh, you know, so weak there that it would be possible for a typical person to run across the, the surface? Lake. Run across the lake. And there are, on Earth, there are some animals that can do it, some very small animals, some insects, but not many. There's a kind of lizard uh, that you may have seen films of, but no people can do that. So they did a lot of calculations, and they also did some experiments. This very short video shows you part of their experiment. All right, I think that was it. That's Curtis. it. <laughs> yeah. And they say they discovered that, yes, Typical person in good health probably could run across the surface of the lake. And, and now I need to ask this film with your saw. I need to make sure this, this is cool. Yeah. Was that sort of a scientific experiment oh, yeah. in a lab? Yeah? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. That is funny. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me ask you about your question. When you ask, was that a scientific thing, mm -hmm. what, what do you mean? But I, I think it's because. To me, I have the idea that you know science is made in very clean labs and it's very you know prestigious and and a man yeah. standing like this with swim feet on in a blue bathtub it just doesn't look like the perception that's, I have of yeah, research. That's one of the big problems with science now 
is that most people have the idea that in order to be science, it has to look yeah. important and expensive and be done in an official place by official people. And none of that is necessary. Mm -mm. None of it. Everybody here is a scientist at times. Mm. And most of us a lot more when we're little kids because we're always discovering things. All of this a scientist does. The only thing that a scientist does is try to understand something. I was just saying the noises. So I just oh, okay. To... Trying to understand something that nobody else has been able to understand and, and understand the truth of it. Mm. And, uh, you know, we look around and there are all kinds of things that we think we understand until somebody says, hey, how does that work? And then you realize, I don't really understand. And sometimes you ask around and it turns out nobody completely understands. There's an awful lot of stuff mm. like that. In fact, most things no scientist truly understands. Mm -hmm. They understand some very, you know, well-defined, tightly defined mm -hmm. things. Um, so maybe we've made quite of a big gap between, you know, a lot yeah, of, I, I guess people here are quite interested in science, but I mean, a lot of society yeah. is not interested, and maybe that's because we also made this gap. It's intimidating, and it's, it's a shame that it is that way. That's especially true in my country, in the United States. In the, in the United States, science is something that must be taken very seriously. And in fact, well, I'm, I'm glad you asked this, because I, I can talk for hours about this. There is the illusion that maybe all of us have, and I think it comes from the way we're taught in school, that all of the great discoveries in science really were great. And when somebody discovered this, or when somebody invented this, everyone realized right away how important it was and how wonderful it was. That's almost never true. If you look at the history of anything, you know, think about anything you learned in school. If you really go and look at the history, when it was first figured out, most people didn't say, oh, this is great. This changes the way we That's not the way it works. Usually, they get laughed at, or people say, I'm not sure that's true, or that doesn't matter. Who cares? Mm. And if you talk to any living scientist, and if you're lucky enough to talk to one who became famous because they discovered something that later everybody realized this is useful, especially if it's something that later people realize there's a lot of money you can make from this. When that happens, that story about what happened originally, when it was just kind of funny, nobody tells the story that way anymore. Now it was always serious. Yeah. And what I've been thinking about a lot, and I, I want to write uh, my next book about this, I think, is the idea of surprise. Because yeah. what's common, this is true with all the Ig Nobel Prizes, but it's also true of everything in science, is, the first stage in something is somebody realizes that there's something surprising here. There's something I did not expect and I don't understand. That's why it's surprising. And that's the very first step in things. The fact that something is really surprising, that does not tell you anything about whether it's important or not, or even whether it's real or not. You know, maybe it's a mistake. Maybe you misinterpreted the thing. Maybe you're looking at it from the wrong side or something. You don't know. But damn, it's so surprising that the only thing you know from that fact that it's surprising is this is worth looking at for another minute or two or another year. It's worth paying a little attention to. Mm. And I really want to look into that more, because every example of science that I know, that I've looked into, it started out being very surprising, and most people couldn't care at all. Most the, the only people who heard about it, most of them thought, I don't care. This isn't important, and I bet you that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, most things that people discover, it turns out that is wrong, and it doesn't matter. So that's, you know, I think. Some of you in the audience, I'm sure, are scientists, and some of you probably kind of hate science. But really, that's the essence of what life is like for most scientists. You know, it's a frustrating thing because they're trying to understand things nobody has been able to understand. And the best days, the best moments, are the moments, the days when they see something and realize, I don't know what that is. It's surprising. 
because that maybe is going to lead to something really good. Mm. Maybe. Hmm. Talking about, you, th you said this thing that there was this big gap. Yeah. Um, is that part of your goal with you know, starting the Ig Nobel Prizes, writing all the columns, to sort of um, close the gap or make people aware that science is not dangerous or science is not? Science is dangerous. <laughs> Sometimes so, maybe. So is, so is what we're doing. Sitting on a uh, chair is dangerous. Sitting on a chair is dangerous. It's living is, existing uh. is dangerous. But not something that you should be afraid of because don't you, you, you don't feel you clever. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. you know, people are afraid yeah. of going into science because maybe yeah, they don't yeah. feel clever enough or it's something to do with math or... Yeah. But no, but children, as you said, they have this curiosity. Yeah, and then but it gets you beaten have... out of them at some point, yeah. usually. In school, maybe. Yeah, or somewhere. But yeah, it's, um, that's a big part of, to me, uh, what the Ig Nobel Prizes are about. It's a good way of getting a lot of people to look at things and not be scared to actually look at it. And it's interesting, you know? It's funny. That's what makes it interesting. But once, once you're interested, you're not scared of it. <laughs> and maybe you're going to wonder about it. And maybe you're going to talk about it with a couple of your friends. And maybe some of them even know a little about it and maybe ha have good ideas about it. So that's science right there. And so that's, that's the, the beginning and the end of what I hope we can accomplish. But I think. Even though it's a very tiny thing, I think it's a really big thing. Mm. Cool. Um, there's also one interesting research uh, that has been done here, and it won the prize in chemistry. Mm -hmm. And it is given to a group for conducting a careful experiment to settle the long-standing scientific question, can people swim faster in syrup or in water? Yes. So can people swim faster in syrup or in water? And did they do an experiment just like this? This is a question. It seems like a silly question. But it, it can lead you to all kinds of questions that would matter to you under some circumstances. And nobody knew the answer. They could write equations to try to figure it out. But the equations never quite were good enough descriptions of nature that they could figure it out. And so they ended up doing a test. But I would, of course, guess that it would be harder to swim in syrup. Well, you can see how it could go either way. Mm. You know, what is your thinking about why it's more difficult because in syrup? Because it's harder to get through. But then on the other hand, maybe I'm the Well, the other side of that is helped. you're pushing against the water when you go forward. and so. Mm. Even though it's harder to get through, it's easier to push against. Hmm. Which of those yeah, works yeah, out? It's, yeah, it's just yeah. not clear no, to I anybody. See. So they got a big swimming pool, an Olympic-sized swimming pool. They got permission to take out the water and fill it with thick syrup. And then they got some swimmers, some really good swimmers, some almost Olympic-class uh. swimmers, to swim, You know, first in water. And then when the swimming pool was filled with syrup. And they did it a lot. And what they discovered was it's the same. It's the same. <laughs> it's the same. The swimmers took the same amount of time to swim in syrup as they did in water. That is interesting, Isn't right? Isn't it? Yeah. And, and next time you're pouring out, oh, any kind of liquid in the kitchen or Oil, if you put oil in your car, if you have a car, or oil on your bicycle, if you have a bicycle, or any, anything that's a little thick, start to look at the way that liquid is behaving. And if you have something that's moving in that liquid, now you know a little bit more about, about that. You know? it's, it's, uh, it begins to open up worlds once you start to pay attention. Mm. Now, before you talked about surprises, and I know that you have a surprise in this bag. Why, do you, yes. Do I you do. think it's time to, uh, to show it to us? I think first we should show the video. I think we should show the video I will, first. Um, Can you explain? I'll tell you that? just a bit yeah. about what you're going to see. This was the acceptance speech for an Ig Nobel Prize winner named Dr. Elena Bodnar. She's a physician. Uh, she got her training in Ukraine and later moved to the United States. She invented a new kind of brassiere. 
It looks like a, a brassiere is a bra. I yeah, didn't know the bra. word. But yeah. A yeah, French word, brassiere. Yeah. Uh, a new kind of bra. It looks like a regular bra, but it's a little different. This is a bra that, in an emergency, can be quickly separated into two face masks. One to save your life, and one to save the life of some lucky person who's nearby you. So Should keep we... in mind, the winners are secret until we introduce them on stage. So this was the first moment anybody in the theater there knew about it when I introduced her. Um, also keep in mind there are a bunch of Nobel Prize winners on that stage who shake hands with the winners and hand them the prizes. Those Nobel Prize winners do not know who the winners are. It comes as a surprise to them. This and, I, and I think we, we start the video at the point where yeah. she has been talking and now she's going to demonstrate yeah. on the Nobel Prize winners. Yes. <laughs> That's the emergency bra. That was the emergency bra. And uh, you might wonder why would somebody invent this? Well, remember the, or, or if you weren't alive then, you may have heard of the Chernobyl power plant meltdown. She was a young doctor in Ukraine when the power plant melted down at Chernobyl. She was one of the doctors who treated some of the victims. She. Uh, said that she and some of the other doctors stay in touch with each other. Every few years they get together, they try to stay in touch with some of the patients because they want to know, as time goes ahead, what is the real medical story of what happened there. They thought they knew at the time, but later on they realized parts of it, they, they were wrong. And she said one thing they discovered that surprised them was the worst medical damage came not from the direct radiation on people's skin, but from the little particles, the radioactive particles in the air that people breathed in. Once things got into people's lungs, that was very bad news. Once she realized that, she continuously thought about, is there something, some simple inexpensive thing you could put anywhere so that if there's a fire, if there's a volcano, uh, whatever, and the air is filled with, with extremely dangerous stuff. Something you could do to protect yourself just for a few minutes so you could get inside a building where maybe the air is better. And years went by, she got married, she had a baby, and one day she was at home and her little infant son was on the floor. And her little infant son picked up his mother's bra and put it over his face. That was the idea for the emergency bra. I have one here. Oh, that is a surprise. This is one of the first ones, one of the prototypes. Um, I guess I should say this is the only bra that I own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, here. Thank you. You think it'll fit me? I don't know. It's, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> it looks like a, a pretty normal bra. It does, but you'll notice it's got some, some differences. You can split it here? Yeah. All right. It's got some beautiful, clever little engineering. You can split yeah. it. It's also got some straps so that when you put it on, your arms are free. If, if, if but, but normal bras have that as well. Well, this is extra, though. OK. You know, this, you can, oh, this is It's an got extra straps so that ah. you, can, you can seal it around okay. your head and also hold it up. So your arms are free, which you probably want if there's an emergency. Hmm. And there's also some extra wire built yeah. in so that so. it fits tightly across your nose to try to keep the air out. So Is there any special filter in it? This one, no. Just no. Uh, there's enough. So you want me to try it on? Uh, I think we all do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. OK, I'll try. But yeah. Then you'll have to do the talking. OK. It's a bit smelly, uh, but I think that's better than... <laughs> so like this? Like that. All right. Yeah. I'm so glad this is filmed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the two halves are slightly different. Um, yeah. You know, when, when Dr. Bodnar does a demonstration, mm. 
keep in mind, she got a lot of attention around the world mm. from winning this prize, so much that she decided to start a company to sell these. You can buy the you emergency buy, bra that my next on her website. She had at one point, maybe still, I think two factories in China manufacturing these. There are now thousands of people around the world, apparently, who wear these every day. I would wish I could see the audience, because I would like to know if any of the audience you has anyone like this. Um, no? Is there anyone who would like to, if you're not already wearing, is there anyone here who is already wearing a? Yeah, I was just wondering, no. Uh, if not, is there somebody who, who could come up and, and would like to try this on? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, if these have no special filters in them, how yeah. are they different from the one I'm wearing, for instance? Well, uh, first of all, the question is, how is this different from the bra that you're wearing? I, am, I don't have enough knowledge to give you a <laughs> full answer of that. Yeah? Uh, okay. And uh, we've never met. No, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I'm, I'm happy to meet you now. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's not very different. Uh, just any you. kind of material. If you're caught okay, okay, in a okay. bad situation, any kind of material, if you put it tightly over, it will be better than nothing. So that's what this is. But in her test, she said this is enough under many circumstances to gain you a few minutes. Probably is, they're also thicker because they are, you know, yeah. they are thicker than yeah. just your blouse. And eventually, as she had commercial success, she did make extra versions, that, uh, special versions with, with special um, filters and all. But you don't need anything <laughs> terribly special. How does it feel? It feels OK. OK. Um, feels OK. So I'm, I'm trying to get you to speak into the microphone so they can be It would be easier if I take this off, wouldn't it? Probably, yes. Yeah. Um, it, feels, it, it feels like it could work, mm -hmm. um, but somehow it's harder to take on and off than your usual bra. <laughs> Somehow it's easier to do it behind your back than behind your head. Maybe something. I, I don't know how to reply to that. <laughs> <laughs> Should we just give her a hand? Yeah, please. All right, I'll never Thank you so much. Thank you. And during the break, if anybody would like to try this, you know, yeah. we'll be happy to have you try it. Yeah, I guess so. But I think it's a good idea, and, and I will definitely look into it. Yeah. Uh, do you know where she sells the most bras? Is it? Yeah, she said that um, the biggest single audience, the biggest nation, is Japan. Japan. Which has had a lot of problems with the, they had a power plant meltdown of their own, oh. you might remember, and all sorts of uh, bad weather things happen there. Earthquakes. When, uh, whenever she's giving a public talk, and you've seen she's a very elegant woman, oh. and she dresses elegantly. She describes the bra, she talks about the technical aspects of it, and then she says, but the most important thing is, it's a beautiful piece of lingerie. <laughs> so it's actually something you want to wear. Or maybe not you, but some would want to wear. Yeah. It makes a lovely gift, that's the way yes. she puts it, yes. So now there's only five minutes, four minutes till the break, ah. and I think we should maybe now show a video which has absolutely nothing to do with water, which mm -hmm. this one did not have yes. either, really, um, but which has to do with um, incompetence. Yes. So would you elaborate I'll, a little I'll bit about this. that? Yes. The Ig Nobel ceremony I mentioned is an elaborate ceremony, although it moves at very, very high speed. We have the 10 winners. Each of them is going to give an acceptance speech. And we tell them, keep it really short. But of course, you know what happens when you have a lot of people giving speeches. And we, we have a way, we figured out a way after a number of years to keep it short. We, um, we have a, every year we go out and we find a really cute little eight-year-old girl. And this little girl sits on the side of the stage. And I introduce her at the start of the ceremony. I explain that whenever this little girl feels that somebody has talked long enough, she will let them know. <laughs> and whenever we tell the winners, you get about one minute. So if they talk longer than that, the little girl gets up and she walks all the way across the stage. She goes up to the person who's talking and she looks at that person and she says, please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. She doesn't stop until they do. And it works. In fact, this is how well it works. The first year that we had that little girl, 
The whole ceremony was one hour shorter than the year before. <laughs> and every year, it's now been 20 years that we've had the little girl, 21 years. Uh, every year, we finish just about on time. So now, that was. Yeah, so with, there's that. There's a lot of other stuff that happens. But one thing that happens was one year, a long time ago, we, we just thought maybe may fun to write a little opera, a very short opera that's performed as part of the ceremony, where the songs will happen between the announcements of the new winners. And uh, I had never done anything like write an opera. So I, I wrote the story and the words, um, stole the music from some dead composers. We went out and we got some really good opera singers. And uh, we did it, and, and it was so much fun that we did another opera the next year, and that was fun. So now we've had a new opera every year for 23 years. Uh, it, it's, they're written so that in the final song, the final act, the Nobel laureates who are on stage get to come in and act. They don't sing, but they, we have a little you know, acting part for them. So that's usually kind of a thrill for them, a nice thing, something they don't get to do all that often. And, this is going to be, uh, what you're going to see is the, a recording from the Ig Nobel ceremony about, I think, three years ago, two, three years ago. And it's about incompetence. We, um, we, we gave out a prize one year to uh, a psychology research paper you may have heard of because the author's names are becoming famous. Uh, what they wrote about is now called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Their names are Dunning and Kruger. And it's about incompetent people compared with people who are competent at anything, at whatever. And what they discovered was that most of the time, people who are not competent, people who are demonstrably incompetent at something, usually don't realize it. They usually think they're pretty good. <laughs> and they don't see any difference between themselves and the people who really are good. That's now known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, especially in my country, in the US, um, that phrase has been in the news a lot the last couple of years. Wonder why. <laughs> this opera, the final act of it, the character, the main character who will do most of the singing is uh, a psychologist who, for whatever reason, decides to go into a pub, go into a bar where he's a stranger and explain to everybody in this pub all about the Dunning-Kruger effect. So you're going to see this psychologist go in there and explain all about the Dunning-Kruger effect to these strangers. And you're going to see the people who are in there, the customers and the people who work there, how they react to him. So here is the Dunning-Kruger song. But no, their own incompetence. No, incompetence. <laughs> Thank you so much. That also gave us and gave you a good idea of uh, parts of the ceremony. But for now, we would just like to thank Mark Abraham.